Of course, in just a, a little over a week, we'll be celebrating the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so most of you have heard me say this a million times. You get tired of hearing it, but I guess I got to say what I got to say is, you know, if, if uh, you know, Christmas is not, I didn't, I didn't bring my Bahambug hat today. I was going to bring it. I didn't bring it. But without the cross, Christmas is nothing. And without Christmas, the cross is nothing. Without the incarnation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if he wasn't God born in the flesh, and when he hung on the cross, he was just another martyr. He was just a man who, who died. And if he had not died on the cross, then the babe in the manger would just be a little babe in the manger, just another baby born. Maybe a good teacher or a good prophet or whatever. But they go together. It's a package deal. And in the Old Testament, God spoke through the prophets about the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Deliverer, the Deliverer in Zion. And all through the prophets, uh, God makes promises of one who would come and make everything right. Now, we need somebody to make some things right. I thank God that even as our uh, sister Kathy testified a little bit, he's made things right in my life, and he's making things right in my life. There's still some things that need to be worked on. And he'll make things right in your life if you let him. But someday he's going to come back and he's going to establish his kingdom and everything's going to be right. He was predicted in the Old Testament. Hundreds of years before his arrival, God announced through his prophets that he would come. And there were two strains of prophecy in the Old Testament. We're just going to look at a couple here in the prophet Isaiah. One dealt with the conquering Savior, the, the king who would establish a kingdom. That's the one they were looking for when he came the first time. But there's another strain of prophecy that talks about the suffering Savior. And I'm just going to read a few passages from Isaiah this morning, if you follow with me. Isaiah chapter 7. We'll start here. And we'll start with verse 10. And I always like to, I always like to put things in context. And every, every Christmas time, somewhere down the line, I preach on this. So those of you who have come here probably have heard this. But I like to put things in context. It says in verse 10 that the Lord spoke again unto Ahaz. Ahaz was a king of Judah. And he was a rotten king. He wasn't a good one. As a matter of fact, Ahaz was responsible for, uh, he went to Damascus and he saw a, a temple to an idol god and he told one of the priests, he said, make a, make a drawing of that because I want one of them back in Jerusalem. Ahaz really didn't care about what God had to say. He, he had his own agenda. And uh, he actually believed that the, the gods of the Syrians were more powerful than Yahweh, the god of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when Isaiah, the prophet, was talking to King Ahaz, he was talking to somebody that was not God-friendly. He was talking to what we would call an antichrist. Okay. Somebody who was opposed to God's purpose. We got a few of them. He said to Ahaz, and what was happening was the, the enemies of, of Israel were surrounding Judah, and Ahaz was afraid. And God wanted to send a message to Ahaz to let him know if he would put his trust in him, it would be okay. So Isaiah said to Ahaz, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. He said, listen, if you're, if you're afraid of the enemy that's coming here surrounding the city, just ask God. He'll show you what he wants to do. Ask him to make the sun stand still. He did that. Ask him to make the, uh, the waters of Jordan go backward. Ask him to, just, just ask him to, tell him what kind of sign. Tell him, t tell him to make the moon turn blood red. D ask him to give you a sign. He'll give you, whatever you want. He'll, he'll affirm the fact that he wants you to win this battle. Just ask him. I wish some prophet would come to me sometime and say, you know, ask a sign of God. I have a few I could ask about. But Ahaz... You would think if I had been Ahaz, I would have said, man, you know, 
Make it rain upward or something. Do something like, you know, that only God could do. Like Gideon did with the fleece, okay? He gave him a blank check. He said, ask God whatever you want. But old Ahaz, he was, he was going to be pious. He was going to be really holy. Well, I'm not going to ask. Neither will I tempt the Lord. Oh, I'm not going to ask God. Sounded pretty good, but he didn't want to hear what God had to say. He didn't want to hear from God. He had his, his mind made up. There were other gods he wanted to worship. And Isaiah said, the Lord speaking through Isaiah, he said this. Hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Man, just, you know, sometimes we can make God tired. Okay. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Now, here we go. Here's a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah is looking beyond the, 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 the circumstances at that time, and he's lo looking on into the future. He says, I'm going to send you a deliverer to a, 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 a stiff-necked and stubborn people. Israel, I'm going to send you a deliverer. He says, hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Here's the sign that God's going to give. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Oh, wait, a virgins can't conceive. Virgin means they knew not a man. I mean, we all know how that works, the birds and the bees, you know. We, we know how that functions. But God is saying, I'm going to give you a sign that nobody else could give you. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. So I'm going to send you a Savior. 700 years before Christ was born, he made that promise. God with us. Us. When the angel came to Mary, when the angel came to Joseph, he said, you shall call his name Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. God with us. He says, butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. This is dealing with, this is kind of one of those difficult verses, but I believe it's dealing with his upbringing in a rural area. The butter and honey thing was like a rural thing. God was telling his people, I'm going to send you a deliverer who will come. Turn a couple chapters over to Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 9. And looking at verse... Well, we'll just look at verse 6. It's a similar situation. The, the, the Jews were in trouble. They were surrounded. Their enemies were coming against them. They were facing a battle. And the prophet says in verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. You know that, that Christ's child had a beginning in that manger in Bethlehem, but the son was eternal. The child was born, but the son was given. The Son of God became flesh, became man, like us, was born like we're born. Uh, had to be changed and had to be fed and had to be raised and had to be taught. He says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And listen to the description of that little babe in the manger whose birth we're celebrating in just a few days. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Everything's going to rest on him. The, the leadership, the rulership of this earth is going to rest on him. He says, His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. These were the titles, these were the names of that little babe laying in the manger. When people looked at him, all they saw was a little baby. There were some who recognized him. He didn't have a halo around his head. He didn't have, you know, we see those pictures with everybody, Joseph and Mary, that got halos. They didn't have halos. If they would have had halos, everybody would have thought there was something special about them, but they, nobody thought anything special about them except those who had the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that in a minute. But all these names, it says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, 
to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth ever for ever, uh, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This, this little babe born in a manger in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago will be the eternal king of everything. Hallelujah. He is the eternal king of everything. He's the creator. He spoke everything into existence. So we see these prophecies that talk about this conquering, mighty king who would come and rule everything. And there's so many more. You could spend a lot of time looking. There's something like over 430 messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. We're not going to look at all of them. But you could, you could, if, you, if you do a study, if you do a word study or do a topical study, you look up the messianic prophecies in the Psalms and all the books of the Old Testament. There's some kind of prophetic utterance looking forward to the coming of Jesus. Now, these prophets, when they saw these things happen, they didn't see... It has two events. We know that Jesus came the first time, and he was crucified, and he was buried, and he rose again, was resurrected, and he is currently seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us, and we believe he's coming back. But the Old Testament prophets were not given the luxury of seeing both comings. They saw everything as one event. So when they saw this coming of the king, they just presumed it would be a one-shot deal. At least that's what they saw. That's what God showed them. But I want to look at another passage, and it's a passage of Scripture I know most of us are very familiar with. We've been reading about the kingly, the conquering king that comes. But there was another strain of prophecy that talked about the suffering Savior. See, the reason there's a lot of people, they love Christmas because it's the, you know, the Christmas spirit. Because a little baby born in the manger, you can't, you can't hate that. Even if you're an atheist. Well, I guess some of them do. They don't, want, they don't want to see it. But, you know, the idea of a little baby. But don't, don't they understand that little baby came to die? Over in Isaiah chapter 53. We know some of us, we've read it so many times. It's really an Easter passage, but it's, no, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a Christmas. It's, it's about the Messiah. And we're going to back up into chapter 52 and start with verse 13 and read into chapter 53, okay? Same prophet Isaiah. He says, Behold my servant. He's speaking for the Lord here. My servant will deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And many were astonished at thee. His visage was so marred more than any man. And his form more than the sons of man. We can't imagine what Jesus would look like hanging on that cross. They've tried to in movies. They've tried to portray it in different ways. And some of them have been very graphic. But I don't think we could even imagine how horrible that would have been. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they consider. Now, chapter 53. And here's... The cha this, this chapter of the Bible is never read in a modern Jewish synagogue. You know that? The Messianic ones will. The ones who believe in Jesus will. But the Reformed and the Orthodox Jews, they bypass Isaiah chapter 53. Because they know who it refers to. And the veil is over their eyes. And they don't want, just like the people of Jesus' time, the scribes and the Pharisees, they don't want to own up to the fact that they're not Lord. Jesus is Lord. But listen to what it says. Who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? This doesn't make sense. To people that aren't saved and don't have, it doesn't make sense that God would send his son to die for us. It doesn't make sense. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness that when we shall see him, there is no beauty in him. We should desire in him. Uh, you know, with these pictures we see of Jesus as a little child. Look, he looked like any other little kid that lived in Nazareth at that time. There was nothing special about him. People try to make up stories when he was a little kid. He made little wooden birds and they flew away. That's just nonsense. He was just a kid. He might have, you know, threw rocks at birds. I don't know. But, but he was just a kid. He did what kids do. And he grew up and he learned, but he never sinned. Okay? That's the one thing. Wouldn't it be nice if he had kids that didn't sin? Oh, hallelujah. All right. Okay. There was nothing about him that would make him remarkable. When he was born, he was just a little baby. He had to be changed, had to be fed. 
As he grew, he had to learn how to do things just like we do. Listen to what it says. He is despised and rejected of men. Why do they want to take the Ten Commandments down from the schools? Because they hate Jesus. Why do they want to take the prayer? They, they took the prayer out of the school because they hate Jesus. They try to say it's you know, separation of church and state. Now, it's, it's they hate Jesus. Why, why have Christians been persecuted for thousands of years? Because they hate Christ. And I'm really convinced that most of, most of them believe that there was a Jesus. They try to make believe that they, that, oh, we don't believe in Christ. It's just a myth. From, I, I, you know what? I believe that every, every human being somewhere deep down inside knows that there's a God. Because we have some of God in us. But they hate the idea that there's a God they have to bow down to. Mankind hates the idea that there's, there's, some, there's some being out there that, that, that holds us accountable for how we live. Nobody likes to be held accountable. Now listen, it's quiet in here this morning. <laughs> okay. He's despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. We despise him and we esteem him not. Don't show me the cross, you know, show me the mangers. Yeah, oh, that's great. But that cross thing, keep that away. I, it's bloody, it's ugly. I don't want that. Man, there's churches today who want to take the cross off the wall. They don't want to preach about sin. They don't want to preach about repentance because people don't like to hear it. Well, that's what Jesus preached. That's why nobody, that's why they didn't want to hear him. When he was started doing miracles and raising the dead and feeding hungry people, you know, miraculously, everybody flocked around him. But when he said, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, they said, look for somebody else. Not for us. He says, surely, in verse 4, he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The reason why people don't want to look at Jesus, think about Jesus hanging on the cross, because that's a picture of them in their sin. It's a picture of our sin. It's a picture of what we, who we are. He says, he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God. They thought he was crazy. They thought he was being punished. They mocked him and made up stories about him. And they're doing the same thing today. It's not going to change. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are what? Healed. See, without, without the cross, the manger is worthless. Without the cross, Christmas is just, it's just another day. My dad used to say that. I said, Dad, Christmas is coming. He said, just another day. Now I find myself saying the same thing. <laughs> it's just another day. But our sorrows, our griefs, we thought he was crazy. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep, all we, every one of us, we've gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Father, Yahweh, has taken my sin and your sin and the sin of everybody that's ever lived and placed it upon him when he was on that cross. Jesus never sinned. He never became a sinner. But he bore my sin. You want to celebrate Christmas? Think about that. I'm glad somebody was willing to take my sin. Nobody else could take it. Nobody else would take it. But if I could find somebody who'd be willing to, it wouldn't be any good anyhow. We've all gone astray. We've turned our way, everyone, to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In verse 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not. He never pled his case. 
When he was in front of Pilate, Pontius Pilate said, don't you know I have the power to take your life? And Jesus said, you don't have any power but what's been given to you. Pilate was amazed that he wasn't pleading and begging. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is done. So he opened not his mouth. The only thing he said when he was hanging on that cross and they were mocking him and making fun of him, he said, Father, forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. I might not have said that. Listen. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living and for the transgression of my people he was stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. 700 years before it happened. Don't tell me it's a myth. 700 years before it happened, God showed Isaiah the suffering Savior. See, we all want, we all want God to be like Santa Claus. We all want them to just meet my need. But God is looking at us and saying, do you know what I've already given you? What I've already done for you? Do you know the gift I've given you? The gift of eternal life. Now listen, Isaiah 53 isn't over yet. It said, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. God God wasn't sad when Christ went to the cross. He didn't cry. He didn't say, oh, what, oh they're taking Jesus to the cross. That was, that was decided before the beginning of the foundations of the earth. And when Jesus went up there, you know what the word says? If you read the Old Testament, we talked about this uh, the other night. Whenever they, would, whenever they would make an offering, or last week when we were talking about prayer, we, we talked about whenever they would bring an offering or a sacrifice, the Bible says that was a sweet-smelling savor to the Lord. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, the Father was up there saying, yeah, sacrifice, that's right. That's what, that's what, that's what I, that's my plan. It's horrible of what, the thing that Jesus went through, the Father was up in heaven saying, yeah. I smell it. I smell the savor of the sacrifice. I see the sins of all the world being dealt with right now. I I can sense it. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Listen, I'm so thankful that Jesus went to the cross. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. He bore my sin, my sorrows forever. And now I have hope of eternity. Man, this Christmas time, we ought to celebrate. <laughs> if you're saved. Listen, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. When God looked down and Jesus said, My Lord, my Lord, why have thou forsaken me? God was saying, I haven't forsaken you, man. Get, I'm, it's, it's a sweet smell. I can smell it. I can, oh, it's, this is what, this is what, this, all of eternity is uh, based upon what's going on right now on the cross. The Father was pleased. We can't handle that because when we think of the suffering Savior, we feel sad and bad and oh God, they beat, Jesus, they beat you up and they, and they tore your skin and they ripped your beard out and they put a crown of thorns and we think how horrible that is. But the Father in heaven was saying yes. He says, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. I thank God. I'm justified this morning. I'm not justified because I've been baptized. I'm not justified because I'm a preacher. I'm not justified because I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm not justified. I'm justified because of what Jesus did and nothing else. And I can't add nothing to it and I can't take nothing from it. And that's a a Christmas present. (laughs) 
Therefore, he says, will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. How, he's praying for me. He's praying for you. When he was on that cross, he prayed for the sinners who were there, who went before, and who would come after. And the Bible tells me he's seated at the right hand of the Father right now, making intercession for me and for you. I got, man, I'm glad I got somebody praying for me. <laughs> I want you to look at one more passage with me in the New Testament. Now, we've been looking at the Old Testament. I want you to see the Christmas story in the New Testament. We're not going to turn to the Gospels. We're not going to turn to Luke or Matthew. But I want you to turn with me to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. And starting at verse 5. Here's the Christmas story in the New Testament. This is the Christmas story. The Apostle Paul writes, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is what Jesus was thinking. And this is what we ought to be thinking. This is the King James. You might have a modern version. It's a little different. But it says, it, it both says the same thing. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What he's saying is, he was the eternal son of God. He was with the Father for all of eternity. Uh, before anything was, he was, he existed. But he was willing to step out of that relationship uh, and come into this earth as a man. If you want to get a picture of that, turn to Isaiah chapter 6. We're not going to turn there. He was in his high and lifted up in his train filled the temple. And the angel was crying, holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. That's where Jesus was before he came here on Christmas. He said he, was, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God or he was willing to release. He thought that that equality was not something to be held on to or grasped after. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. He willingly poured his glory out from being in, with a heavenly father, high and lifted up, into being a little babe in a manger. Needed his diaper changed, needed fed. This is the creator of everything. Decided to be born just like the little Savannah over there. Little baby. Had to be carried around. Listen. He took upon himself the form of a servant. You remember when Jesus was with his disciples on the night before his crucifixion? And he took a towel and he began to wipe the feet of his disciples. Remember that? Washing their feet. And Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you don't want to have anything to do with me. If the, if the master of everything, if the creator of everything was willing to get on his knees and wash the feet of his disciples, how much more? That was a lesson he told his disciples. He said, if I'm willing to do this to you, how much more should you be willing to serve somebody else? Took upon himself of a... Of, uh, the form of a servant, it was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. See, that's the thing is, it's so hard to want to die. And I'm not talking about dying physically. You know, I mean, we're all going to die someday. But I'm talking about dying to ourselves. Jesus told his disciples, he says, If any man will come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. For if a man love his life, he'll lose it. But if he's willing to lose his life for my sake, he'll find it. How much are we willing? If Jesus was willing to, to come here and be obedient unto death, how much are we willing to die? to ourselves, to our flesh, to our fleshly nature. How much are we willing to be used by God? You know what I find out? The biggest, the biggest obstacle to people being used by God is their ego and their attitude. 
Okay. That's why Paul began this chapter by saying, uh, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But that's another message. I don't want to go back there. Verse 8, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But wait a minute, that's not the end of the story. Verse 9, and this is, this is like a repetition of Isaiah chapter 53. Wherefore God has highly exalted him. When he went, before he could go to the, to the throne, he had to go to the cross. Before he could obtain the crown, he had to get the crown of thorns. But now he is highly exalted and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and uh, things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want to tell you something. You better confess him as Lord here because if you wait till you get on the other side of the green, it's going to be a, a horrible time. See, that's why it's important. When these, these things happen and people were driven to God, all those lives that were lost at that school up there, if one or two or three people come to Christ and get saved, it might be worth something. It makes some kind of sense out of that nonsense. It's the Christmas story. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every human being that ever lived, if we don't do it in this life, we're going to do it in the next only to be cast into a lake of fire. But every human being that ever lived will confess that Jesus is the Lord. I want to ask you this morning, as we prepare to close, have you confessed him as your Lord? See, we, it's easy, and we were talking about this earlier too with somebody, I think. You know, everybody's a Christian. You know, say, everybody's a Christian. Everybody, you're a Christian? Oh, I'm a Christian. How you living? Well, I'm, I'm a Christian. I said the prayer. You know. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. I really think that most of the people who said that prayer don't have a clue even what they're saying. They think it's some kind of magic words. You know, abracadabra. Poof, Christian. I don't know. Either we're not teaching it or people ain't listening. But this Christian thing isn't about coming to church. It's not even about doing good things. It's about dying to self and putting your trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. What we read about here, that's what Christmas is about. Man, the reason why, the reason why I hate Christmas time is because most people don't have a clue of what it's about. But I want us to know. Every one of us this year are going to be with family, friends, loved ones. Get together. It's a good thing. Get together with family. And, but I hope and pray this year. And I always say this prayer for myself. And sometimes I fall short. I hope and pray this year that, that the people I get together with, by the time they, they end up leaving me, they're going to know what Christmas is about. They're going to they're know the meaning of Christmas. It's not about friends and family. That's a good thing. I mean, I love to get together. I, I used to tell a story. My, my grandmother, man, Christmas time, she would have, you know, soup and ham and turkey and I mean we get together and have a great time they do them seven fish things you know <laughs> the, the Italians do that's good I mean that's a good family getting together but more important than that it's about what he did on the cross them poor people up there in that town up, up in Connecticut their Christmas this year it's not going to be the world's Christmas spirit I can remember back in 1993, my dad passed away on Christmas Eve. And uh, when they had the funeral, they asked me, he was Catholic, they had the funeral of Catholic Church, but they let me do the eulogy. And I said, you know what? I said, this is the, this is the Christmas message. Jesus Christ came to die for sinners. And there's always something that's going to mess up your Christmas. How many know what I'm talking about? But if we focus on what the Christmas is really about, ain't nobody can mess that up. Because I don't care. Uh, if I keep talking, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> and I don't want to. I don't want to make anybody mad. You know, I don't want to make anybody mad at me. <laughs> now, make sure you know what Christmas is about this year. 
Make sure you know what Christmas is about. Jesus Christ died to save sinners, of whom I am chief. You can put your hand up if you want to. But that's the gift he gave to me. And if I never get another Christmas present, it's all right. If I never sing another Christmas carol, or it's all right. Because I know, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, I have a hope of eternity to be with him. I want to celebrate his birth every day. Every day I want to celebrate his birth, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Every day I want to thank God for what he did for me. I hope you do the same. Amen? There's a song we all sing. You all know it. Uh, My soul finds rest in God alone. He only is my salvation, my rock, my peace, my fortress strong, I will ever love and adore. Won't you stand with me? Great love of God, Jesus, his name, he only is my foundation. And on that cross he bled and died. And he took my sorrows forever. And on that cross he bled and died. And he took my sorrows forever. And I will love him, come what Will you love him when things get hard? Will you love him when, when trouble comes? Will you love him when it seems like the world is being turned upside down? Will you love him? Will you love him? If he never does another thing for you, will you love him because of what he did on the cross? See, he's given us promises, precious promises. But will you love him forever?